In the clearing I stand, a boxer, putting all your shit in boxes, dragging the boxes to this stupid clearing. I am your waiter tonight and my name is Dimitri is more or less the title of a poem by John Ashbery. By taking the universe apart, he will have reintegrated it with his own vitality. And it is this reintegrated universe that will in turn possess him and give him rest. If this voyage reveals a futility, it is a futility worth facing. Not pictured is the book Invisible Fences by Stephen Monty about prose poetry from, like French and English prose poetry from Baudelaire to Ashbury, basically. That would be an appendix to this collection, but I no longer have it. This has got to be the biggest collection I have. At 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 volumes, I count. And these ones have like a thousand pages, of course. So this video is a long time coming, and it's basically I'm doing it because I got a request to do it. Um, so that means there's two requests to do this, one coming from someone else and one coming from me. And the way I'm going to structure this is here are standalone poetry collections. Here are like selections slash collections, I think. And then here are prose books. So to begin, we have rivers and mountains in this really beautiful copy that I kind of forget where I got it from. But I've talked about the design of it with my mom before. And it's got a really nice back cover, too. It was $3.50. It's got a nice kind of sheen to it. Um, really doesn't have much in the way of blurbs. It looks like it's a reprint from the Echo Press for something called the American Poetry Series 12. This is not like a first edition of this book. It's just a handsome reprint. You'll notice like the absence of serifs everywhere. Here are the other books in the American Poetry Series. Do any of you recognize these or like them? I mean, I recognize The House on Marshland. I thought it was The House on the Marshland. But, um, and I had a book by Louise Bogan once. I don't think it was the best Louise book to get. If you, if you all recommend another Louise book, please, um, a Louise Bogan, uh, please let me know. So it's got this really nice, um, table of contents page. It's very minimal and we should all copy the design for whatever pamphlets or books we make. And it's maybe my favorite table of contents page in all of Ashbury for its contents and then also its general aesthetics. Um, of course, the, the closers are really good. The one it begins with is an Ashbury favorite. It's collected in many other places. And then others of these are like real gems. Um, yeah. See how over there it just says contents, you know, and then like, it's just really nicely designed. This is like, without question, I think the most nicely designed Ashbury book I have. Um, which is, I think, saying a lot because this one's really good, if you have the marbled one. For those of you who are fans of these lacustrine cities, there is audio on the Pen Sound uh, Ashbury Audio Archive of Ashbury, um, like, explaining it because someone... Well, like, not explaining it, but walking through meanings he takes from the poem because an interviewer is saying, hey, just go ahead and walk us through what meanings you find. You all will like Into the Dusk Charged Air... Um, if you like Ulipen kind of constraints, this is this is my guess for maybe what was for maybe the poem that was published in Locus Solus. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it's got this uh, restriction where every line has to contain a river. Clepsydra. I one time once I I, I typed it out and printed out my own copy of it, which is which was fun. Thus far in my life, I've read Clepsydra more than the Skaters, but. Um, I hope to get more into the skaters soon. Of course, the way, it, way it's laid out is, again, top-notch. If you can find this copy of Rivers and Mountains, it will serve you well. The next one is Three Poems, uh, which, I wanted to, which I'd wanted to find for a long time. Uh, I kept on looking online and seeing that penguin one with the, with the marbling. That's kind of, I think, a parallel to this one, maybe. Uh, this is like an, an early paperback of it. It's got this like classic cover of, you know, Ashbury looking rakish, uh, which is a word I, I, I love to use. And um, it is a good copy. The spine's a little stiff. I found it at Half Price Books. It was a Half Price Books fine. Two twenty five, a Viking Compass book, um, 
we're at like, you know, the book is like 115 pages, I think, or something like that. 100, yeah, 115 or so, 118 pages. And for fans of the system, if, if the system grabs you out of here, um, I used to think that copies of this book were, would go for a lot, lot, lot of money, but they actually don't. You can, you can find them around. Just stay vigilant, you know, make sure to look at eBay. I haven't read, in this exact copy, I haven't read much other than, much outside of The New Spirit. I read a decent chunk of The New Spirit in this copy. Next, we have a copy of Self-Portrait in a Convex Mirror that I bought, you know, on the obligation that, like, you know, you you need to, like, you know, with, with because I was obligated to. You know, this poem is, like, the one of the first Ashbury poems that I really kind of cried to and couldn't get through because... It was so emotionally overwhelming that like the person I was reading it with me and me were, were both um, like overcome and it was kind of difficult to make progress. Um, if you haven't read this one out loud with a loved one, I recommend you do so. It has a sequence of poems in it, Farm, Farm 2 and Farm 3 that are shorter poems and they're pretty inspiring, I gotta say. Um, there are a lot of poems in here that I haven't really given enough thought to, I think. But hey, any of these books we can just do a whole long video on or seven whole long videos on. The point of this is just to kind of give you an, an idea of what the book is like in the collection. Like this one is one that I don't really take down that much because I have this this poem in the uh, collected poems 1956 to 1987. And I think it's also somewhere else. Yeah, it's also in here. This is where I first read it. And we'll get to this one shortly. And, you know, the covers of this book, I think they started out pretty darn good. There's that blue and green one that, you know, I yet may collect, or I may yet collect. I don't know why I'm talking this way, but uh, I may get that one still because that one's beautiful. Um, I don't really take this one out that much because it's not the prettiest one. And I don't think it, you know, feels like the best one volume to kind of take care of all my Ashbury needs if I'm on the go. I think that would be, I would, I would go for the, the selected one. Um, but this one I think is not as ugly a cover as the black one where it's like, um, this, the, the portrait of Parmigianino is like down in the corner and it's much smaller. Uh, yeah, but this one's a good one to have. I think it has a font that's unique in my collection, this kind of rounder font. It's, it's bold and it's, it's round. And I don't know, it reminds me of like, I guess Garamond, maybe, that you'd type with. Um, I uh, Some of the poems are very short. I think this is the shortest one, Tarpaulin. And I think that like, when you're into Ashbury's long poems and you flip through his collections, like your eyes are kind of drawn to the short ones and the prose ones, because they just visually are shocking. And they kind of make you then want to choose forms that are, you know, prose or... Um, yeah, prose or uh, short poems because you want to be uh, you know, visually striking. Next, we're going in chronological order of when the poem books were published, I think, to, to my knowledge. The next book after Self-Portrait in a Convex Mirror that I have is Houseboat Days. I've repaired it poorly with scotch tape. It has on the cover um, a, a detail from a, 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 a work of art by, I think, Joseph Cornell. Houseboat Days, I think it's called, or maybe it's not. Let can we can we just figure out figure this out? Yep, cover painting is not by Joseph Cornell. Cover painting by R. B. Kitaj, Houseboat Days for John Ashbury. So, but it's from a London private collection, so it's not from Ashbury's own private collection. Um, I got this one from the Strand in Manhattan. This one has a little uh, erratum message in it. The only, really the only part of the book that I really felt like I knew before reading it was Fantasia on the Nut Brown Maid, uh, because the prose poem at the end of it, unless this is the shelf of whatever happens, which reminds me of the question opening of Clepsydra, this is in, again, the selected. I have several, I, I put several notes in here. Interestingly, this book came with this erratum slip, um, tucked into it that says, due to an unfortunate typesetting error, a line has been printed in an... Due to an unfortunate typesetting error, a line has been printed in an incorrect position. Line six on page 83, falling back to the vase again like a fountain, responsible, should be deleted. It appears 
in the correct place on page 88. So we can actually take a look at page 88 and we see, my warm regards are cold, falling back to the vase again like a fountain, responsible to whom? So this is actually like a unique copy of the poem. And you know, there's a couple points to make here. Like if you have a, if, if, a, if a line's out of place in Ashbury, like you're, you're not gonna know, right? Like, uh, and it, it's not gonna feel like it matters so much. You're still just in the mood to discover um, meaningful lines that kind of fall all around the place accidentally anyway. So it doesn't really make much substantive dis difference to your reading experience. It only matters, I guess, if you're some sort of scholar of Fantasia on the Nut Brown Maid. Anyway, I keep that erratum slip tuck tucked right in there. The spine on my copy, I will say, is in bad condition. It's like I cracked. I think it, the book almost split in half, which is why I had to do the tape thing. Even this one, even though this one's a much more uh, fragile penguin paperback than this self-portrait in a convex mirror, I end up taking this one out with me more. I think because I don't know why. Maybe it just feels like um, it would surprise me more, even though I know nothing about this book. Like I, I know next to nothing, but you know, besides, you know, like kind of the titles of many of the poems, besides the title poem and a lot about the title poem. Other things I'll say about this uh, collection are that I really love the poem Valentine that's in here, if I can find that. Um, uh, Wet Casements is the one that Harold Bloom likes a lot. Of course I like Valentine because for a long time I was just really into any um, any poem that was a prose poem, and, and I would mark out in my Ashbury books wherever one of the poems in them was a prose poem. And here we've got a, a fortune tucked in, which is cool. What does this say? You will be showered with good luck. Wow, let's keep that in there. Let's not get rid of that. I really don't want to, I really don't want to like cheapen like the, the, the touchingness of Valentine. It's really good. This whole stanza is a real, is like, it's a masterpiece of, Colloquial Ashbury and just personism following uh, Ashbury. Ashbury. Ashbury as personism adherent. And I've scanned this poem and emailed it to friends before. And if, if you need a scan, let me know. Another thing is this poem, Street Musicians, is in The Selected. And I kind of slept on it for a while. And then um, I guess I had more life experience and went through more ups and downs with friends or something. And this poem became one of the dopest in the entire bibliography, one of the most evocative and like most re-recitable and most um, meaningful. And it's just this long, it's just these two stanzas. You could just screen, screen cap your, your YouTube right now and just, you know, take it. Which makes me feel like it's kind of illegal the way I do booktube where it's like, I show a lot of excerpts from the book and like, I'll just show pages where there are whole poems. It makes me feel like somebody might crack down and be like, eh, no, not really. I mean, you're going to want to buy the books. I mean, the whole premise of this booktube channel is that you're somebody who kind of likes collecting them, you know, and likes them as objects. So anyway, you can see the hearts that I put by Valentine. Anyway, enough about houseboat days. That's one that I want to get to know more in the future. Now, continuing our superficial discussion of the standalone volumes in my collection, we get to Hotel Lo Tremont, which... I maybe took off of Sam's nightstand, or not, or his coffee table. And then I wrote all over it. Uh, look at this lackluster subtitle I found fit to put on my books. I, I'll put subtitles on my Ashbury books a lot throughout the years. I've been reading them for the last five years. So, um, and, and typically I want these subtitles to be good, you know, and, but I actually, actually don't really need them to be good. They can just be anything. Like the whole point is that they can be anything. I mean, like, reading Ashbury is more of a kind of, I don't know, it's like a, uh, I don't know, it's like an act of faith that nurtures faith. It's not like you're going to get, like, a specific object off the shelf or something. Um, the uh, I added a couple of things to the table of contents there. Again, just keeping it superficial, we can, I should read these books and try to, like, understand them more. So this is the one that I liked most first out of this book, Baked Alaska. That's the one I'll single out. It will do, it's not perfect, but it will do until something better comes along. It's not perfect, it stinks. 
How are we gonna get out of having it until something comes along? Some ride or other. Let me try that again. It'll do. It's not perfect, but it'll do until something better comes along. It's not perfect. It stinks. You know, like just like you, you getting to like uh, it, it, my favorite thing about Ashbury was just how it's um, it's something where you can really lay into it in performance. And this was like an early example that showed me that. This one will often strike you. It's another Hotel Low Tremont one. And it's like uh, got these um, these little choruses, you know, throughout, which is just another cool thing. Another example of how as you get acquainted with a poet's body of work, you're going to be rewarded by like getting introduced to their friends, their forms that they kind of make up. Either they're imaginary friends or they're real friends, real forms that have real pedigrees. I said I'd only single out one, but I want to single out uh, another one here. Um, where we went for lunch um, is in, I think, three parts. And this third part here is, um, again, I said I used to like really just hunt for any prose section in the books. And this one was a real, this one's a real knockout. It's one of the best prose stanzas that I can think of. And all of Ashbury really deserves to be in the collection. High watermark, very lovely, very Frank O'Hara y, very, um, very touching. The book itself is kind of awkward because it's a little squarer, you know? So it, it doesn't kind of, it's not the same width as the rest of your books. And so it'll kind of stick out if it's on the shelf, typically, unless you've got a nice deep shelf. Um, on the front, I think this is actually Joseph Cornell. Yeah, so this is from a private collection. Um, I wonder if it's from Ashbury's own pi private collection. I wonder if he had a private collection of, of Cornell objects. That's probably something that I'll learn from reading The Songs We Know Best, which is uh, the book about his early life that I recently checked out of the library. In addition to its squareness, it's very heavy. Um, it's kind of a, you know, if you can get this one, it was when, it was when he was publishing with Knopp. And so that is, that encompasses the period where he also published a flow chart with them. And they um, must have just really lavished a lot of resources into this publication. And so even though it is a paperback, the pages have a nice textured quality to them. I don't know if you can see on this, but the pages are slightly ridged. They have a nice, like, um, like, uh, you know, ruffle, ruffled, you know, ruffles, you know, ridgy quality. And it's a... And it's a really, really long collection, um, you know, 150 pages. So maybe it's like, I don't know, you know, maybe it's like when he was writing Flowchart, it's like just the, 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 the crazy productivity that you need to have in order to write Flowchart will necessarily mean that there are a bunch of things on the cutting room floor. And, and it's like a, a lot of things on the cutting room floor in addition to like a steady diet of like the, the poems that would have already made the collection anyway. Maybe like something about it being a long time since April Galleons uh, meant that this was gonna be like a really long collection of short poems. This is like a favorite to just um, hang out with, this book. Um, it's really beautiful and it's a luxurious experience. If you're having a hot cocoa and you want an Ashbury, go there, I guess. I mean, we're keeping it superficial. I mean, this is just my collection, you know? You get like kind of scared to make videos like this because you're like, you know, this person's important to me I hope I don't, uh, you know, turn people off of him or sound like I am not in love with the, with the actual, you know, texts. Um, um, next, another book from the 90s is Girls on the Run. Was inspired to read this one out of the collected poems 1991 to 2000 after reading Flowchart aloud. Um, I read this one aloud too and had a similarly great time. Um, and I just, so when I had the opportunity to get a standalone, I jumped at the chance. Spine's a little stiff on this one, and it has that thing that, like, I guess humidity does to books that are kind of laminated, where, like, little rivulets open up that have, you know, lines of air that make these kind of ridges in the, in the, in the cover of the book. Some of my books have this really bad, like, my complete tales and poems of Edgar Allan Poe, which is over there. And you actually get the benefit of having a picture by Henry Darger on the front which I think can be a useful visual to have with you as you're reading through. Um, you don't have any visual like that when you're reading in um, the collected poems, the Library of America, 1991 to 2001. And now we reach a worldly country, 
um, by John Ashbery in a paperback edition. This, so this is my second copy of this in a paperback. Um, it's my third copy of it total. I had a hardcover that I, I loaned out to somebody. Um, I loaned out my first paperback to somebody. Um, this is where I started. On, on hearing that John Ashbery died in September 2017, I was like, uh, I think I was reading maybe, you know, pieces in memoriam, and I was re re reading um, just like little bits about him. And I was like, well, I know that there are some of his late books or some of the some of his um, kind of recent looking books at at Powell's in Hyde Park that are on sale. And I want to get one. And this was the one I got. And I think it was like pretty uh, cheap. I wonder if you can see what price I paid for it um, in here that was erased out. Yeah, it was only three bucks. Um, a brain pacemaker, its tone becomes legible. There, I think there are a bunch of um, notes in here that could have served as subtitles to the book. Um, that's the title page. I mean, I just really loved this thing. And when I read it, it was, it was really, um, uh, it was really, it really left an impression on me because it was the first time I was reading Ashbury and like really laughing and performing the poems out loud and making my friends laugh with them and just seeing how you could take, and then seeing how poems like them could be made easily by doing a cut and paste kind of collage style um, on, on like a text edit document um, in your, on your computer. And then like seeing the value of that, how you would get flashes of insight. You could, um, you could read the collage you made. The, the, the poem that you made would, would actually make, bring you delight because you would be able to kind of speak, I don't know, uh, you know, take old pieces of text or random bits of text and, and bring them to life and read them and, and, and make them uh, sizzle when they're in juxtaposition with other things and make them funny, make them actually funny and take them out of context kind of, you know, and, and, and make them funny. Anyway, like all of the basic pleasures of actually just reading Ashbury aloud came to me through this book. And um, uh, I read this one a lot. I think this is the one that I take with me most often. It's the one I think I've written in most, although the Houseboat Days one has a bunch of, uh, uh, you know, things written. I mean, this one, The Ecstasy, I love so much that I haven't even, like, written anything around it. I think I may have... Oh, come on. Um, uh, this one uh, deserves, you know, seven videos unto its own, and I really recommend it as a place to start if you like Ashbury. I mean, in addition to, like, how funny the Ashbury poems in it are, you know, the, the typical stuff, the typical late stuff. You also get the title poem, which is extremely good to recite and will um, is extremely quotable and has one of the most beautiful endings in all of Ashbury, as far as I can tell. And just as waves are anchored to the bottom of the sea, we must reach the shallows before God cuts us free. I mean, God cutting you free, I mean, just, you know, it gives you chills. Um, that's my next standalone one. More on that to come, and more on all these to come. I mean, uh, this this video is already kind of comically long, but uh, but yeah, if you want to hear more about any of these Ashburys, please let me know. I mean, I want to hear more from them and about them, um, from myself and others. So, I mean, that's why I'm making this video. It's a step in that process. And then lastly, I have Planisphere, which was reviewed by Anthony Madrid, and I could do like my Anthony Madrid books collection, I guess, in a video. Um, or talk about Madrid more later, but like um, uh, Anthony Madrid reviewed this book and talks about what he likes that Ashbury does and what he doesn't like that Ashbury does. And uh, this book has, um, I haven't read this book in full. Um, I think it might actually have come after Notes from the Air. I think, yeah, it has this late Ashbury thing uh, where they did all the titles like this. Um, I think it's my second most recent, like, book of, of his. Um, yeah, they did all the titles in the square font. This one's a funny one. Uh, I read, actually, I, I remember diving into this one. Um, it has a really nice title page. Um, I remember diving into this one some and finding it funny, and I was making, actually, a list of ones that I liked the most. I guess I got to page 87, and these were ones that were favorites, favorites so far. So this is another example of how you can use like a post-it glossary to help you or a post-it contents or a post-it index. 
didn't read the book in this edition, but now I have it. There's a nice amount of line space in this edition. Um, something I notice. Here's another look at that, uh, that title page. It reminds me of something that um, Wave Books would do like a while ago. Not something that Wave Books would do now, but something that Wave Books would do a while ago. Planisphere, John Ashbery, you know, with you know, that there. And, I mean, that's like, come on. Come on, that's, aren't you hyped for this movie? Just to substantiate my claim that I thought that that's something that Wave Books would do, here's Calamities by Renee Gladman, who's a writer we should definitely talk about more. I, I really like her sensibility and the books of hers that I have. Um, but see, it's got this like script and it's got this, um, like everything is kind of stark and minimally designed, except for this like badass script. Um, and that kind of that kind of reminds you of what was going on in the title page here. All right, a half hour later, and we are to selections and collections. I'm gonna have one of these bananas. So this book is the second really important Ashbury book that I got after I got A Worldly Country. Um, hashtag. Uh, I got it from Sem Co-op, and you can see there's a little bit of, like, water, you know, kind of waviness to the cover. Um, it came with this big written, this big thing written in the front, No More OK, which seemed to either be, like, somebody saying that they're never going to be happy again, or somebody saying that they would please like to never read any more of John Ashbery. And so here you see... Um, uh, the quality of my of my edition is really interesting. It's like if you have this penguin paperback, you typically have the one that has like the smooth paper with a little band at the bottom, and it says Penguin Poets, and it's in the same series as it's in the same series as books like The Narrow Circle and you know Ted Berrigan's Sonnets. Like if you look in the back of any one of the books, you see it's John Ashbery, self Selected Poems, Self Portrait in a Convex Mirror. Anyway, so most of those copies of Selected Poems have like a smooth paper to them. But um, mine is this kind of, this one I prefer, which doesn't have the, the, the kind of interruption of the marbling pattern, that's that bottom bar. And it also has this nice textured paper all around, which makes for a kind of Hotel Lautremont-ish, um, you know, luxurious experience. Maybe of note, and forgive me if I've said this before, but this is the book that the main character in Leaving the Atocha Station takes with them to Spain. This collection is where I first discovered um, Self-Portrait in a Convex Mirror, Clepsidra, um, really some trees, the instruction manual, first read it out of here. Um, it was where I first got into Shadow Train, which um, has become a really good collection for if you just want to recite an Ashbury poem, because um, they're all short and very funny and quotable. This is one of my favorites, and I've quoted it a lot in various like conversations and works of art. The one about Warren G. Harding, Qualm. I have this this marker that I like that's got like a golden color to it, and if I'm using that color on a book, it means that I'm really enjoying myself. It means basically that I've struck gold. This is the poem after which uh, the biography I'm reading is named. Uh, it's also where I first discovered the system. Um, from three poems, and I, I don't think I've ever read the system in one si sitting, like, all the way through, but read selections from the middle, read the end, read the beginning several times. Um, there's a stanza somewhere in here that I've underlined a lot. Here's the one that I underlined a lot. Um, I guess I just must have been on something that day. I just think it's beautiful when underlines, again, are very straight. That's just, we don't have any, um, it's not, it's not very high level over here on the Leafy Concern channel. We're, we're, we're still just uh, kind of hung up on that rows of text are straight. But um, in any case, um, a friend of mine is writing a long prose poem and I scanned this one. And so um, this one doesn't have a... A friend of mine is writing a long poem and I, I scanned this one and um, it's got a lot of underlines in it, a uh, good page and, and notes like that. So, um, uh, scans of this will uh, have those notes. Also, it, 
things from this book are really easy to scan because like the book like opens really well like the binding is is like strong even though you like crease it and open it a lot so it's just a very durable book which i think kind of contributes to a lot of people having this be like a go-to ashbury book that they like take around and learn from also i think rivers and mountains has um the best overall design of any ashbury book but i think this one has my personal favorite cover like it's sentimental in that you know, I also like the cover for A Worldly Country, which is another sentimental book, and it's another blurry kind of, um, like a blurry uh, cover. Um, but uh, this one is, I think, the prettiest uh, cover, in my opinion. This book is a good place to also to learn about um, how good A Wave is as a collection, and particularly The Lone Dale Operator is a favorite. We could talk about this book for a couple of hours, and we will, but uh, let's just move on. Next book is, uh, I got this one, Collected Poems 1991 to 2000. I got it based off of uh, Michael Robbins' review of it in, I think, art in, in book form. And as soon as I got it, I read um, Flowchart from it out loud, and then I read Girls on the Run from it out loud. And these days, when I return to it, I admire Debit Night. Um, Debit Night is a poem in Can You Hear a Bird? And Can You Hear a Bird just has a really great um, table of contents, not not least because, it, or, 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 why am I talking this way? Can You Hear Bird has a really nice um, table of contents. It contains fucking sarcophagi. And then it's also um, in a, a alphabetical order. Um, the pages in this book are thicker than the pages in the other Library of America volume that I've found. These are like onion skin, and these are like a little thicker. The book isn't quite a thousand pages, but it's, uh, or, or, yeah, it's actually only about 800, but it's every bit as thick, if not thicker than this one. Um, I like the picture of Ashbury on there, um, a nice, humble uh, gaze. A weary gaze, you know, someone who read a bunch of Proust and then got wiser and sadder, you know. Um, and then another thing that you'll you'll notice if you get these Library of America books is that they have a bunch of uncollected poems, which are kind of invaluable here's two, two Norwegian moods which I've blown a lot of people's minds with like I'll read this one and well not blown there I, I it's not, it doesn't blow your mind but it's like uh you know it's another thing where it's like huh that's a poem you know that can be a poem for a second I thought this one contains seasonal but it doesn't seasonal is one that I love 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 but seasonal is in the first volume of of the two volume of the two volumes of the Library America edition of his stuff, um, uh, 1956 to 1987. So basically, some trees to uh, April galleons. And this one has a uh, description of a mask, which is one of my favorite prose pieces. And then also in the uncollected section, dang, it has a dream, a prose dream. You know, this is just too good to be true. And this is uncollected, so you've never seen this before. It's got Turendo from uh, that Turendo and other poems that's published by the Tibor de Na Nagy Gallery, um, it's, which is that like first pamphlet of his. And it's also got this very early poem, Seasonal, which is from when the po poet was 18, and it was published in, um, in poetry under the name Joel Michael Symington. And it's just really pretty. Another one to read with a loved one. This is my only copy of As We Know is in here and litany is really a, an amazing read um i come back to this one a lot because it has um the vermont notebook uh which is awesome to to have um yeah it's got all the drawings reproduct reproduced um it's really difficult to get a copy of that outside of this book the cover paper is like shiny on both of them, but this one, it's like a little duller. I think it's just because I've had, I've touched this one and handled this one more. This is the one I got first and it's a little duller and this one's like a nice shiny little thing. And the, the pages are onion skin, as I've said, and it does, it does reach the thousand page mark. And, uh, yeah, I don't know, like, <sighs> there's obviously an infinity of things to say about these books. Another good thing this one has is it has all of Tennis Court Oath, so you can get stuff like Europe. Um, so you can read every section and linger on each section, you know, just like you wanna. 
The next one is the mooring of starting out. Um, I have a, 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 a things that I've tucked into this. I tucked in um, a a typed up copy of the instruction manual and then also my handwritten copy of seasonal. Um, I recently read the instruction manual out of here. Uh, this is this one's uh, a a good one to get. It's pretty commonly found. It has all three poems. It has all of uh, Double Dream of Spring and Rivers and Mountains, of course. Um, you just can't go wrong with this one. Uh, but I mean, it, it overlaps with something, some other uh, books of his I have. But a lot of people who are into Ashbury collect multiple editions of Ashbury's books, I think. Um, I recently got this one that has its aesthetic uh, coffee stains on there that are, that are printed on there. Um, three books, uh, you know, I already love all three of these. So getting them in this nice package was a kind of kind of a no-brainer. This would be a good one to take on a road trip. Um, uh, yeah, uh, I don't really, I haven't read this one yet. This is like kind of a more recent acquisition. The picture on the cover is a Van Gogh-like detail, which I think is cool, a good get. Uh, and it's just like a handsome copy. I like the kind of, I like the off-white, the parchmentiness of it. Um, the, the design is clearly like, in emulation, it's it's clearly a pair with it's it's clearly a pair with this one. You know, they're both penguins. This one is uh, valuable in my collection because it has a bunch of later poems, stuff from post two thousand, that I don't have anywhere else. So it has selections from Chinese whispers and where shall I wander? It contains Myrtle, which is the poem that Michael Robbins talks with Paul Muldoon about on uh, on the. New Yorker Poetry Podcast. Where Shall I Wander gives you more of that amazing prose of his, which we'll get into more prose of Ashbury's later. A nice long book, 350 pages. A hard cover with a deckled edge, you know? Um, and this one isn't too tough to find. I kind of recommend getting this one. Um, it's a really nice, luxurious experience. Um, gives you that feeling like you can just kind of play around and relax and, uh, uh, and, and, and um, relaxing while reading Ashbury is a really good way of doing it. But you can also stress out. Both are fun. Underneath the jacket, it's got this nice beige. Um, you know, nothing really remarkable at all about that. The jacket, I give it like a, you know, like a eight out of 10. I kind of like it. It's plain, but I don't give it, no, I give it like a seven and a half. I also neglected to give you a view of what this one looks like under the jacket. It is cloth bound and it has definitely more of a look of like a 90s like academic text or something. Um, and yeah, it's a little bit handsomer and also it does have a golden ribbon. So, uh, And then the last collection or selection I have is this parallel movement of the hands that came out this year, I want to say. Yeah. And... Um, I haven't really read it that much. I read the foreword and I read like the postscript and I read I read a decent portion of a long and sleepy history. More prose, of course. This one I'd like to read and 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 give more of an opinion on. Um because it's a really unique book. It's like um it's like a Roussel how I wrote certain of my books kind of thing where it's it's a collection of things that are like explanatory and then also the object themselves. I don't know. And under its jacket, we get a very similar kind of uh, beige, but it's got a nice speckle to it. So it's much better than the uh, than what Echo did with the um, notes from the air under jacket area. There's a sequence of poems in here that are based on Cherny etudes, which I think is just a really, really cool idea. I am a piano player and I liked playing Cherny etude, etudes. I have and um, you get a lot of cool um, titles, chord passages, alternating fingers at speed, wide position in fortissimo, crossing the hands naturally and with a fine touch, the fat ride once over dwindled to taxonomy. I mean, you just, you can't make this stuff up. I mean, it's a, uh, not a place to start, but if you're a fan, I mean, you, you gotta have this, I think, I'm pretty sure. So for those of you who aren't, totally tired of me by now we're gonna move on to the pros uh, we have a nest of ninnies i thought i was gonna i wasn't gonna find this for a long time if you look on the uh 
on the Dalkey Archive website, they say that this one's out of print. Oh, well, they don't say it's out of print. They say sold out, which is distinct from out of print, I think. This is something I wanted to find for a long time because I like the idea of writing a novel by just proceeding a line at a time, you know, like and just feeling your way into the dark. Doing it with a friend is also cool to think about. And um, it's inspired me to do similar things where like, you know, somebody writes a sentence and somebody else writes another. Um, it's funny. It's a funny read aloud. It's I think it's a more boring read aloud than flowchart, of course, but it's um, I don't know. It's worth getting and reading uh, more on this later. I would really like to reread this and remember uh, some some of the, some of the dinner parties that happen and try to get some thoughts together on it. And also just like imbibe its atmosphere. It's line by line, you know, like like vaguely humorous, but sort of punchline-less atmosphere. Um, it's really good. And um, it's still, it's published with like the same font that it was published with originally, I think. It's probably like a facsimile. But uh, a lot of, a lot of um, dialogue, because of course dialogue suits, suits um, you know, doing one, somebody writes one line and somebody else writes the other. It's like a, you know, if it's like blah, blah, blah said and somebody else said, then that makes a lot of sense. Victor came back with some small bottles of what appeared to be a powerful orange dye. They ran out of Coca-Cola, he said apologetically. Um, it's just, it's, it, it's, it's a worthwhile book to read, especially if you like funny novels. This is actually my only book by James Schuyler, because I don't, I don't have Alfred and Guinevere, which is uh, a, a big gap in my collection of books. This one I got offline, Reported Sightings. Um, it's like another cloth-bound hardcover book. This one's a little harder to find um, from his days at Knopf. I think it's like an earlier 90s book. It's like 1993 book. And uh, of special note here is the, is the, um, is the article about wallpaper. So you, you see like in the table of context, in the table of contents, we get like kinds of figures that he's gonna talk about. And then we get objects at the end, and wallpaper is the um, the crown jewel of the objects portion. Or it's, uh, you know, it's the finale. But then we get poets and painters. It's another big book, big square book, big heavy book, luxurious. Um, good to read aloud. Introduced me, actually, to, like, Ashbery as critic, which... <clears throat> um, I mean, he's an amazing critic, and of course his ability to write really lucidly as a critic ties into how good his expressions are in his poems and how varied and, um, and, and intelligible his sentences are in his poems. And then this leads us to our last book. Like, as a critic, he really is amazing here. I checked this out of the library once a while ago, and I wanna do a whole video on this book, but it's a really amazing little book. It's a small little thing published by Harvard, it's his lectures that he gave at Harvard about poets that have been important to him that maybe aren't um, so well known to other people. As I've been reading it, I've been using as a bookmark in it this little card of sports trivia. Um, somebody gave me, um, or somebody uh, uh, went to um, the thrift store and got a bunch of trivia cards and then didn't realize that they were sports trivia until they'd uh, taken the trivia cards home. And so they they basically became like trash to them. So I started using them as bookmarks. Um, about this book physically, I, I will say I really like the way it looks outside of the jacket. I could do without the embossing of like other traditions into there, even, even though it's kind of dope. Um, I like the brown. Um, it's a nice humble package um, fit for the simple statements of love for these very, um, this very motley crew of poets. Um, this, uh, yeah, bunch of humble failed figures that are really worth discovering. This book has been amazing and I want to talk more about that, um, in, in more detail. I'm starting to get hoarse, so I'm going to call it here, but that tower is my collection of John Ashbery books. And now you, there you have it. That's basically the, um, that's the extent of it. Oh, wait. I also have this copy of Fence that I took off of the coffee table in the in the creative writing building. Sorry, everybody. But um, it has Ashbury poems on the front and the back. Rambling Statement and Front and Pearl. And I don't think these have been collected in a book yet. 
if they were in a book, they were probably in not Breezeway, but Commotion of the Birds, which is a book that I really want to get. Um, for some reason, that's up here in this other shelf. So yeah, as my collections grow and mutate and I gather them, like I'll just make videos here because it's booktube. We want to take a look at the books. And then also like viewer, if you want me to, if you like want me to read more of one of these and like talk more about one of these in particular, or you want more stuff like this, just, you know, say, um, cause we can take a closer look at any one of these things, but this is just the book, the, the video I've long anticipated making. This is the video I've long anticipated making about this like massive stack of Ashbury books that I've accumulated since fall 2017. Um, wishing everybody happy day of reading. Bye.